architect in the past. Uh, I used to be a domain architect for a few years in the past as well. And I have grown up uh, being engineer for, I would say, uh, approximately seven or even maybe 10 years, right? So I had this kind of full experience going from the operations, from the engineering, almost from the level one up to the dealing with the business. And now in like some, I would say a little bit managerial role as well. However, um, when I was asked if I could present something interesting, I think that the, the topic most closely to my area of interest is actually the business continuity uh, because I was um, heavily involved uh, in that in the past. Mm, and as well, I was uh, responsible for creating some kind of the solutions as well. And so, yeah, this was the reason why I have decided, okay, this is maybe a, uh, a story worth sharing with you. Um, just to manage some kind of the expectations uh, on this session, there's not going to be any kind of a hard coding stuff. Uh, this is more, you know, like why we need this in the first place and potentially just to, for the, those that are joining the session that are starting the stair steps as an architect or they are starting or they are having some vast experience with, as a DevOps engineers or engineers, I would like to go this because I would emphasize, I will be emphasizing on the business aspect, why we need this. And based on my experience, I really do enjoy, I, I've seen myself how being able to speak in those terms with the business helps you uh, on a daily basis to drive the solutions in the right direction, right? Because if you're going to give some examples uh, and refer to you know, like the availability, then the customer is more willingly to chip in a little bit more than expected or anticipated in the beginning. But without the further ado, uh, as you might already have noticed, I do like to talk quite a lot. So I think this is also somehow the reason why I'm doing this this one as well. Yeah, so during this uh, during this session, um, there's going to be some kind of thing like the introduction and the definition of the business continuity and recoverability, why the, des the design for availability and recoverability, uh, how the service indicators works, how we can test those, and we'll be going over some of the, um, you know, like the how we can test those uh, in uh, in the maybe not in the production, but how we can verify that our plans are working on that one. And I will be going with you over some of the technical examples. And I have just um, a, a little bit of spoiler. Uh, we are going to have a real life example from from I think even today as well mm, that. Well, I hope will allow us to know why it's important to to design for this BCP as well. Okay, so before we start, start, I would like to start with the story uh, as a, you know, like the introduction, uh, and I would like to use uh, something that I do assume mo also mo most of us are using on a daily basis. So I would like to start with giving some kind of a reference in that one. So for that particular reference, I have used one of the you know, like the company that is delivering the packages, right? So they are known for their brand. Everybody's using them. Uh, as part of their service portfolio, <clears throat> they have this kind of quite a vast um, the service definition, right? What kind of the services they are providing to their customers? Uh, what types of those services they are? They can be, you know, like the product families, additional services, solutions families, right? So we can have, you know, like the ocean fries. If we are big a company, we can have, you know, like a small packages, parcels, emails, stuff like that. And this is uh, important for this business because the DHL, the delivery companies, they are literally built around it. So if they are going to fail on some of those, their future is not so bright, in my opinion, as well. <clears throat> so... Going into some additional details, uh, I have allowed myself to go over the DHL service offering. And as you can see, they have a different types of products. They have a different kind of DSLAs for those as well. And in that case, I would like to focus on the one particular region, which is the DHL Express. And when I was searching for the additional description of that, I found the following, right? So we have the DHL Domestic Express Service Description. So this is informative for the end users uh, and uh, for the consumers of the service, right? Time critical shipments within the Netherlands in this particular region, electronic proof of delivery, and the shipment is guaranteed before the end of the next working day, which is in the current world, a uh, very important aspect apparently, right? <clears throat> Additionally, to what is uh, the foundation of the service, we can have to some kind of a premium features as well, right? So we can have the kind of electronic um, uh, monitoring for that as well. We have, can 
utilize this in our business. We can use the um, portal and the services that the DHL is providing as such. Uh, however, uh, as each service description, and they were smart enough, and uh, they were smart enough to do some kind of a service limitation, right? So this service is only available for particular parcels in regards of the their weight, their dimensions, how much you can do this per 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 you know like the package that you want to set, right? So this is this is a starting point uh, for for you know the service service oriented approach, service definition, and so on and so forth. However, there are things that are beyond uh, beyond companies and the service control, the things that they are just happening, right? So uh, as you can see, this is actually one of this happened, I think, last year in Poland. And you can see the DHL employees successfully trying to save some packages because they know that the service, uh, this is quite important for them and for their company. Then uh, be advised that whenever we are talking about the services and so we have this terms of agreements and you can see that uh, with the terms of agreements for this particular service we have for example some money back guarantee right so if they will fail to deliver they will pay us back on that one right however i do estimate that it's, it will take quite a amount of time to justify and to work with their customer support however each appropriate described service should have some kind of term, terms of conditions um as well so uh what if, uh, what if, uh, now I would like to ask uh, you to ask the question yourself as well. Okay, service definition is going to be over optimistic, right? I'm going to deliver next next hour, right? Service will expect some kind of a degradation, just like this failure of this kind of delivery truck. Service will be out of you know, like the service itself, right? Just like it is happening with the cloud providers as well. And, you know, like perhaps their product is so awesome that everybody is going to use them and the service can scale or, or brace for the extensive world. Or, which is, you know, like something um, also very commonly happening for, for not only the IT, but the other brands as well. There are going to be some competitors you now with providing better services and they will advertise this uh, as a, you know, like even cheaper service, right? So this is... I would like to start, and I hope that you know, like I've built some kind of fundamentals for. So let's start with the services, and then having those kind of fundamentals, we can move forward for why, uh, what drivers, uh, what drivers can we utilize when we are working with the solutions when we're creating those um, on our daily activities, right? So whenever we are going to design a new solution, so we have this uh, obvious idea, right? Obvious idea is going to be followed by the engineering aspect. So this is very commonly when we, as an architect, we are entering uh, and working closely with the people, companies, stakeholders that have the idea for something smart to be done. And then when we have those architecture visions, then we are moving this into the actual working the solutions, right? When we are um, working with such, when we are being engaged and we are supporting business, uh, it is also very you know, like important to kind of setting the stage uh, for that one as well. My preferred method for that is that I have used to work with the Zachman framework. There are different frameworks, how to approach this. You all have worked with some different ones. We as a software have a custom approach here as well, so that is all fine. So normally I personally follow the requirements, the assumptions, the constraints and risks because this allows me to capture, capture what uh, what the business and what the stakeholders they are looking for. And then I'm going to use this to actually deep dive into, you know, like what, what have to be done, right? So we have those requirements, which will cover the things that the project solution must achieve, can be divided into two subcategories, so functional and non-functional, and some examples um, linked with the, this session, like the business continuity, right? So system must provide four nights of the uptimes, solution has to provide some kind of performance according to the SLAs and the KPIs. And maybe for some of those, uh, you know, the infrastructure have to be, costs have to be reduced by a particular amount of that, right? For the non-functional, I'm using the AMP RSS. So those are the additional aspects that I try to emphasize when working with the stakeholders, like important aspect being availability, manageability, performance, recoverability, and lastly, security. So we have the service, we have some kind of uh, framework, how to operate with those kind of services and the state and the business. And now we can move slowly towards the, uh, why do we have to design for recoverability and the business continuity? I would start with some definitions before I will move forward. So the BCP, 
So business continuity is a business level of readiness to maintain the critical functions after an emergency or a disruption. Those events can include security breaches, natural disasters, power outages, equipment failures, sudden staff departure even, right? However, what when I was preparing for the session, I, I even realized that those terms are very often being used interchangeably, right? So people tend to use, okay, BCP is disaster recovery, BCP is availability. And I came up to the idea that it needs a little bit of, of um, double down on that because they are layered in my opinion as well, right? So we have a BCP, then we have a disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is uh, the organization method of regaining the access and functionality to its entire infrastructure after events like natural disaster, cyber attacks, or even business disruptions. A variety of disaster recovery methods can be part of a disaster recovery plan. So we have the disaster recovery, then we have disaster recovery plans as well. Uh, DR is one of the aspects of the business continuity. And then we have the availability aspect. So availability can be understood as a, some sort of a metric SLA in that aspect as well, right? So okay. availability is the probability that the system will work as required, when required during the period of a mission of a time. Measured in terms of time, most commonly, five nines means less than five minutes um, of outage during the year. And now I would like to try to show you, in my opinion, how those transfers in, into particular regions, right? So we start with the BCP as being some a policy in that area. Then we have disaster recovery, which is plan oriented. And then we have the availability, which is our KPI, which is our goal in regards to the and those uh, those system being available for our customers, for our staff. Uh, rule of nines. So for those of you that did not uh, kind of face those um, rule of rules of nines. So this is you know like a pretty common term as of now to establish. Okay, what is what is the availability requirements, right? And whenever you will hear somebody saying, "Hey, I need four nines of uptime," business might say that, or we can try to ask business, "Okay, what are your?" And expectations on that. So four nines means that per year we are going to have approximately one hour of outage, right? And then we can have this divided into the months and weeks, right? So as you can see, the increase in the availability requirements, this definitely makes our solution more and more pro complex in that regard, because we then have to follow the, um, the appropriate way to make sure that, okay, in regards of the five nines, five minutes a year of a downtime, that's a really tight number, right? And the more the more those goes, the more problematic for us to design those solutions is going to be. Okay, now I'm going to talk about this business continuity as well a little bit uh, more. So the business continuity is maintaining the business operation, uh, service availability, brand trust. This is so whenever our um systems they are going to be impacted and they are not going to be available for a severe period of time the brand that we are working with this is going to be definitely impacted right so so our customers might not be interested to continue our cooperation with us on that one as well then we have a partnership as well uh, like if we are unable to provide the service in reliable terms the partners that we have the customers they are not going to will they are not supposed to work that much with us as well. Okay, now I will use some kind of additional um, aspects here to try to represent why is the business continuity important and what kind of the aspects we can try to utilize from that um, as well. So we can start with the planning. So we can have, you know, like the risk assessments, the business needs, the people and procedures. This can be the part of the planning session and planning, establishing policies as well. Then we have the governance aspect, when we have the policies, compliance, and the review process, how our overall business continuity works, followed by the execution. So uh, at this time, the companies are introducing the drills, the response plans, the cycling improvements, right? Because they are testing this, they are doing those drills. So they are able to notify and observe any shortcomings uh, and they can improve on top of that, right? And last, we have the tools for that, right? So for some of those, we can have disaster recovery software or the hardware, well, maybe mostly software as of now. Then also we have this backup and restore, right? So in case that we are going to lose any data, we are able to get back to this uh, point of time whenever this is necessary. And the more advanced the companies are becoming, and the more self-service capabilities in the business continuity they're going to provide to their internal customers as well, right? 
So those are the, I would say, um, the planning, the governance, the execution, and the tools aspect that we can incorporate into the business continuity. Why we need those? Uh, why we need the business continuity as said, we can have a natural disasters. This can be earthquakes, floods, fires. This this is happening, you know, like across the time. Um, not much of the people are aware of that. Not much of the people were affected by that until they are, right? So when they are affected, then they're, they're, they're starting to see this and why it's important, right? So it is our role and to think, to design, to, to propose for things that might happen, right? Not uh, to be proactive here, not to be reactive on that one, right? Then we have the mis misconfiguration, right? We know that uh, with this infrastructure as a core, with the automation, right, the potential uh, and this is all good. We This is expected that uh, we need to go this direction. So it, please do not treat this as we shouldn't go this uh, direction. We definitely need to. However, we also need to be aware that the potential blast rages and for misconfiguration with the automation infrastructure as a code and all of those things followed, this potentially increased the blast rages, right? So we can have the mitigation um, implemented on that one. So we are going to have you know, like additional environments. We are going to have additional tests for that. Uh, to prevent any kind of like fat finger misconfiguration kind of the events, right? And lastly, we can have, not lastly, but also we can have a system failures, right? Our service could be degraded and our third party have maybe changed something and this impacted our business, right? The business continuity is also important for us because um, some of the um, verticals that we are cooperating with, they are actually obliged to follow the particular um, security guidelines. I call this framework requirements. So if you are working in the, uh, for example, with the financial data or the personal information data, all of those, um, all of those regulations, and they can be global, and they can be globally recognized, like for example, um, GDPR can be one of those. Um, there are other uh, frameworks that are generally recognized as well. We have this for the um, for the financial transfers, for the financial data operation as well. Um, PCI DSS. I forgot the name actually, and had to had to recall the name for that. So there's a quite awful lot of controls uh, in those frameworks that oblige us uh, and the business to follow the rules and to provide the response whenever they're necessary, right? So it's not only about the security, but part of the security can be that, okay, you can recover from the failure within that amount of time. Your service is going to be available for that amount of time, right? So this is something that we supersede from the, the regulators and we have to have in mind when we are designing for those, right? Uh, recently, a popular topic, uh, recently, for the few years already, and uh, the ransomware is becoming more and more interesting way to get the money by hackers from the companies right so we have to have in mind uh and we have to have we have to be prepared for the situation our system will be affected by some kind of a ransomware right because and uh, they will tell you that okay you can pay you can pay the the money and you will back get back your systems online but that's uh, not a, always the case in that one so companies have to have the plans for that and um, need to have some drills about, okay, how we can react in case of a ransomware, lock out of the critical systems, data, even people sometimes as well, right? So try to imagine what would happen, like, for example, if our access to the Active Directory or any other LDAP solution would be broken, right? Because of some kind of a vulnerability that was abused and by the hackers, right? So this put our, our business into the jeopardy. And also there's this data loss aspect. <clears throat> so... In the past, those were often um, caused by, you know, like the physical failures, right? But there was, there is also this fat finger, right? For example, one of our engineers can can wrongly process the the change that was required, or we can have some kind of a software issue, perhaps that you will render our data useless at this point in time. So it's also important to have this point from which we can. Uh, to which we can um, return to if needed, right? So those are the six of the, uh, you know, like the reasons why I would like to emphasize why the BCP are needed. So please do treat it as a general vectors that we should consider, in my opinion, of course, from the, you know, like creating uh, uh, solutions from the, for, from the designing phase and then later when and how it's going to be implemented. 
I have also, when I was preparing for the session, I was uh, you know, obtaining additional material about the disaster recovery stages. And um, maybe you are not aware of that. However, uh, within the one of my former engagement, um, I was responsible for supporting and developing such um, fully, I would say, um, disaster recovery solutions solution and as part of this process um there was utilization of um i would say of several layers and the way how it goes right so we start with the phase number zero so phase one phase zero means that there is a no disaster recovery in place no backups right so this is this uh, this uh, pyramid is being used to assess the maturity of the disaster recovery process right so then we have uh, have number one we have data backups with no hot site with a hot sites, we can have some kind of electronic vaulting as well, point in time copies, transaction integrity. This is also important because uh, some of you that have some experience under under your belt, you know, like you, you have to recover the separate database, but then there's, uh, there might be some question about the data integrity if our applications have some kind of cache that allowed to store some transaction uh, before they went into the, you know, like the, uh, the databases and so on and so forth. Zero or near uh, zero data loss. So how how the replication will work here, and then uh, the last stages we have the highly automated business integrated solution. When the end users they are getting the disaster recovery as a self service, right? So this is a fully automated. They, they can perform tests on their own, right? They can select particular application. They can conduct the the test of that. They can prove to the, for example, the regulator if needed, that okay, we are conducting those kind of on the on the cyclic basis, right? But now some of you might be puzzled. Okay, how the disaster recovery actually match to the business continuity planning? And I have found, I think, the best representation for that: how to navigate, <clears throat> uh, how to navigate, how to understand with it, right? So this pyramid, on the other hand, um, states that we have the policy, the management and the infrastructure layer. And I really like this because it says that the business continuity in the first place, this is the policy, right? So this is a policy that is set at the companies later on that are being transformed into the policies and the strategies, right? So this is the business continuity plan focusing on the policy layer. Then we have the management layer, risk management, uh, we have you know the, the business continuity plans, and then we have a validation testing, right? So the companies, large companies, enterprises, they are going to have as uh, dedicated, even oftenly persons for that. They are the responsible for the risk management, the BCP and the ER testing and validation and making sure that they are conducting those tests um, as required by regulation, for example. And last but not least, we have this infrastructure layer. Uh, we have the information technology recovery process, alternative sites, data backup and offsite replication, server storage network. And I would like to emphasize that and the disaster recovery plan itself, like an um, exercise without the appropriate processes, uh, this is always going to be only a disaster recovery plan, right? With the processes, with the linked, uh, linking this back towards the, you know, the policies and the management and the processes, then it's the way how it's become a business continuity plan. So this is you know, something that is envisioned and enforced from top to the bottom. Yep. Um, why designing for availability and recoverability? So now I will allow myself for uh, some references and why it is important, right? So I would like to start with, uh, I'm a big military fan, um, for those of you that do not know this. So on the image, you can see the, the so-called hurricane. So this is one of the most commonly produced fighter during the second world war. They have made over 15,000 of that, right? How, why I'm using this is I wanted to use the one of the system that is from uh, one of the system of this particular um, uh, airplane. And this is you know, the, uh, the um, pump that is responsible for, for, the, for the whole hydraulic system. So this is, you can see here a diagram uh, representing the hydraulic system uh, diagram in general, all right? So you, you can clearly see that there's not that much of redundancy at this level. Um, literally, it's uh, all of this, uh, uh, the system, it's a single point of failure. Uh, whatever happens, uh, it's going to be in like uh, during the firefight or or some kind of the, the issue with the with the components being used. So the, the air, airplane will lose some hydraulic support and this will definitely not end well for the pilot and for the plane. Now, moving a little bit towards the recent time. 
So as the aircraft industry becomes more and more and more professionalized uh, after after the Second World War, uh, we have this the passenger aircrafts and so on and so forth. So here you can see how how this have evolved because uh, you you can see that we on we do not have this only redundant system at this point in time because we have two separate lines we can green we can have a yellow hydraulic system but in case that those will be affected we also have some kind of electrical uh, hydraulic backups as well for that and um, I would okay we have uh, we have. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Vadim, thank you very much for this. Vadim have mentioned that uh, at least it, uh, it had hand pump. Uh, so yeah, at least this is, this is something definitely. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. Uh, now I'll move into the, okay, so we have the passenger aircraft somehow um, explained and how the whole designing process, the redundancy, the failovers, the auxiliary systems, how they have evolved. On the other hand, now I would like to present the other case. So here you can see on this image, the F4 Phantom. So this was a fighter jet that was you know, developed in late, in early 60s, I do believe, right? And then we have, you know, like the, another generation of, of fighters, naval carrier based, right? So all of those have two engines, different generations. However, there is something that I would like to emphasize because as some of you might know already, uh, we have this you know, newest F-35, right? And I would like to use this opportunity to ask you, okay, what's the beyond you know, like being stealth? Um, I would like you to ask, okay, what's the difference with the previous one? So you can raise your hand, you can type in the chat, whatever you like. Anyone? have one answer okay yeah Vandem, thank you very much uh, so single engine and you're right on that uh, in the past because the engines were were unreliable that was the reason because uh, that was the reason why the the former um, carrier based fighters they were supplement they were having both engines however at some point in time when creating when designing for the f-35 uh, the constructors, the engineers, that they have the conclusion, uh, conclusion that the failure uh, probability of engine is so low that the having of redundant engine is no longer a requirement at this point in time. Yeah? So this was the reason why moving forward, all of the modern carrier-based aircraft, they are being totally fine with one engine. And uh, now... Ending this kind of, you know, like a reference to the to the aircrafts, I would like to emphasize on the uh, impact of the high requirements on the solution availability design, right? So as you can see, we can have we have two actually lines here. So we have the downtime, and the the less uh, the less downtime we need, the costs are going to grow, right? And it's, it's those are not going to grow uh, like linearly, they are going to, to grow actually, actually extra potentially. So the more nines we can, we have to address the bigger, the costs and the more complex the solution is going to be for us. How do service indicators work? So service indicator is something that we can utilize, um, for, uh, for, for the solution that we are working with. So we can distinguish a three of those. So we can have the SLI, we have, we have service level, um, you know, like uh, key performance metrics. We have the SLO objects and SLA uh, agreements, right? So the SLA, this is, those are the agreements just like with the DHL service. So this is the, their, this is their representation of the, of the, of the service with us. However, they are not showing us in the background, what kind of the SLA, SLIs and SLOs they have on their backend, right? Because of the customer facing is going to be only the SLA, right? So those are the, the, the SLIs, SLOs, SLAs that we can utilize uh, when we are building our systems. And also there's another point uh, which we can utilize um, for the data security and for the system availability is that we can utilize the recovery point objective. So this is a generally refers to calculating how much data can a company loss. And, and this literally establish how often we are going to have to conduct our backup of our data and our systems. And also we have this recovery time objective. So this is a point, in, this is a measurement used how comfortable we are in the downtime of our system, right? So for example, if our application will went down for a few hours uh, and for a, let, let it be like four or five hours, right? So our RTO in such case uh, should be like, okay, RTO, 
equals, for example, four hours, right? This is our goal towards which we're going to design for that, which is again, linked to the availability requirements. Yeah, and this is the uh, graphical representation of the uh, the dependencies between those two, right? So we have a normal operation. Um, so this is the RPO, so disaster strike. So how to, uh, comfortable we are in the data loss, right? So if we are not comfortable with the loss of data for a longer than four hours, that means that our data should be, and that the RPO target should be actually established at four. And also we should double check on that if our solutions and, and components, they are being able to back up within this time, because if our RPO is going to be a four hours and then our solution needs additional three or four hours to complete the backup, that means that our realistic RPO is much higher than the anticipated and accepted by the business losses, right? So you have also to have this in mind. And then we have this RTO. So what is the tolerable amount of downtime, right? So when the disaster strikes and the resume, uh, resume of normal operation will happen. How do you test your recoverability and the business continuity? So here are some examples um, how we can do this, right? So the test itself, please be advised that this is the policy driven, right? So the, those tests um, should be established by a global policy in the company. Uh, normally based on, my, by, based on my experience, this is uh, being driven by the security teams. Uh, and part of that, uh, they are also the not only the IT security, but the business security as well. So this is a policy that is being driven from the organization, from the other unit than ours, towards which we have to validate that our solutions are compliant with, right? Those policies also should be periodic. Um, those policies, if they are established and they are having the periodic tests, those tests should be reoccurring, right? So it's not like we are going to conduct one BCP test and we are done, we are fine, right? Um, in the companies that they have worked, they used to have at least twice uh, twice a year tests of the BC, BCP procedures, which included not only the data centers, the cloud implementations, but also it was before the COVID time. And there was this, uh, I would say, dedicated offsite locations for people to work if so, something bad would happen, right? So they were protecting, they were trying to protect against, okay, we are going to have a office failure, right? And we are unable to conduct the operations. So we were involved in such operations, such and drills, to ensure that even if our, for example, uh, office building would be hit by some kind of a, um, electrical failure, uh, water fa failure, and so on and so forth, we have a separate location towards which we can access in less than, for example, one hour, and we can continue our work uh, without issues. It has changed with the, you know, like the remote work thanks to COVID. And so I think by definition, there's a quite large of the, companies now uh, protected against this. However, you can try to imagine that if we have the work from home, then a lot of companies are using VPNs uh, and VPN solutions. So then we need to make sure that those are tested as well. And because if they will fail, our, our employees can, might end up in a situation when they do not have the access to the corporate network being un unable to work. And then where's my office, right? Because now we are working from home. Um, it is also important that... Um, this should be always treated as a learning experience. Experience. Uh, so if you are involved into creating of those or participating, uh, remember that this, this is being done in the, in a way so we can get this experience and improve the effort and for the, uh, improve the process. Not only, okay, done, 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 done deal, because otherwise, uh, otherwise you can give the, the false positive feedback about it. And in when whenever there's going to be a real disaster happening, and this might lead to, you know, like uh, uh, an outages or inevitability. And hey, we've done the testing, but we've done not test those properly, right? And last but not least, uh, what I would actually recommend here is that whenever the organization are creating those policies, um, this should include not only the practical, but also the theoretical scenarios. Like we can have a two teams uh, playing you know, like what if scenarios, right? And they could challenge each other, right? So uh, we are avoiding the bias that there are, there's a group of people thinking the same way and they didn't see, for example, that there's a truck coming from this direction or there is going to be a fire. And um, a reference from my experience is that uh, when I work in the company that had its data center very closely to the, uh, to the 
soul mill and and uh, guess what the one of the soul mill actually caught catch catch a fire once right so this was also some kind of unexpected by some of the people however after this experience um the, the decision to select another one um a location for another data center this was already included okay so we are going to have the secondary data center in the in in the place when there's not that much of the soul mills or the companies that could catch a fire and things like that right so you can do this uh, proactively and doing some kind of ter theoretical scenarios or you can um, experience this on yourself and then update your policies whenever necessary okay some of the examples um some of the examples for the data loss let me i'm missing this place yeah so some of the examples so how we can test uh for example for the uh for the data loss so we can have you know like the server drive server or drive crash we can have a data center outage right so we we can try to create some kind of tests on that we can try to create some kind of plans how to mitigate with this that not always specifically related to you know like uh, company wide however for example if the processes are are applicable to the applications and application owners so application owners could be asked okay what is your uh plan in in case your data is going to be lost right what how you are going to conduct how you are going to return to the normal operations right so we can have a data loss and events then we can have uh, a data recovery for example being part of it how quickly you can recover the, your complete application right we can have the power outage so um the in order to test this uh, kind of the event you can have as an uh, auxiliary power support uh, we have those kind of power generators somehow as well. Mm -hmm. Then we can have a network outages, right? So we can try to test how resilient we are against this, right? So we can have our redundant switches, redundant network connections going external. We can have some kind of uh, firewalls, stuff like that, right? So this is something um, important to test and to validate. And th those, actually those red versus blue teams, they are becoming very handy because and they are able to challenge each other, right? And they are able to find, identify new tests, new way to improve the service and to make sure that uh, the resiliency and the availability uh, resulting from this is going to be improved along the fly. We can, you know, like try to envision some kind of scenarios when we are going to have a physical disruptions, uh, like for example, uh, yeah, the fire, uh, actually the fire, but uh, I was also involved in one of the scenario when there was actually work being done on the data center and the third party that was responsible for this, they have actually cut some kind of connections between the, uh, between the data center and the outgoing uh, internet. So you have to uh, be aware of that as well. And the emergency communication. And you know, like I would say personally, this is the most mm, despised However, um, based on my experience, I really encourage you to think about the emergency communication because if the company is, you know, you are designing for a solution that is, you know, going to use by a multiple of maybe literally a thousand of people, right? So as part of this BCP plan for, for that uh, for that application, for that system, there should be also, you know, the emergency communication established because, uh the moment when the application stops working, the people will start to you know, like look, look left, look, look right, and there's going to be a gossips uh, unknown, right? And it's, it is very important to have appropriate uh, communication protocols to inform the people what is happening. For example, why the why the why the outage right when do we expect uh when do we expect to get this back on track and when do we expect okay uh we are going to have additional communication right because this allows us to build to maybe not to build but to retain some trust with the end users okay that we have this under control right if there's a no communication for from us as a service owner as an application owner and we are out of business for a few hours maybe a few days right so that's not going to be looking very good from the you know like the brand perspective so very it is very possible that we are going to end up on twitter there are going to be a newsletter writing about this uh, as well and this is some kind of something that we'll definitely need to avoid okay and uh, now because i would still like to give you some kind of additional uh example but this one is going to be actually i hope a technical so or at least related to the technical uh, example so during this this part of the session, I would like to showcase how increasing the requirements of um, the availability requirements, how they are going to impact our 
uh, our solutions complexity, right? So for that one, and please, you know, do not treat this as um, ideal state. I'll just use, you know, like, um, conceptual approach to represent um, uh, the case that we are struggling with with that one. So please do not call me out on that. Hey, you could do this otherwise. Definitely there's 10 ways to achieve something that way, or I'm missing some icon because this service, this particular service has the, have this niche configuration that we should use. So let's assume that we have, this is actually going to be AWS based, but I think that this applies to the Azure or the GCP or on-prem solutions as well, right? So we have, um, we are going to have a pretty simple application. Our application is going to have, you know, like some kind of uh, compute instances and manage database services. And we have some kind of a cloud storage uh, as well. In this kind of scenario, uh, when you're going to review, and I would like uh, I would like very much to emphasize on when you're going to start creating the, the solutions and you, when you're going to start the designing phase of that one, whenever you're using the services, please go over the SLA because those, S and those services have the SLA, they have terms of agreements, they have, um, they have their own understanding what is unavailability. Right, and please do make sure that the unavailability of the cloud service provider is in alignment with what you are going to sell as a business and a technical solution. Right, so be aware aware of that. I would say that with such configuration, we can have um, we can have like three nights perhaps uh, at the best, um, and you know, it, in if the availability zone will fail, and then the service provider, which is the cloud service provider in that case, will say, okay the way to protect against this is going to go into the you know, like the multiple availability zones just in case right so then we are going to introduce additional components into our design we are going to have the additional availability zone then we are going to have some kind of application this might be application load balancer this can be a different uh, type of the load balancer as well but now we are going to have you know like the some additional um, instances for the compute they are going to be located in a um, separate availability zone in order to make them redundant, in order to make them work, we are going to utilize some kind of auto scaling as well, different names for different vendors, right? But as you can see, the complexity is growing each, each step of that one, right? And also for the database part that are going to be managed one, because we, we want to make sure that our solution is quite simple. Uh, we are going to use managed RDS and in that scenario, we are going to have to use the multi um, availabilities on RDSs. So we are going to have a primary, an active, and then we are going to have uh, you know, like the standby, so-called standby that allows us when something bad happens, then we are going to um, uh, switch them over if, if necessary, right? Uh, thankfully, the S3, and this is you know, like the service that is available within the region, so no additional activities are going to be uh, required from our side on that one. Um, uh, we can utilize this for, you know, like the application data and data backups and so on and so forth. Okay. But we are still sitting within the region, right? So we are, I would say bound to particular region and, you know, like everybody wants the, the best and the, the highest availability, right? So a natural, uh, a natural answer for that was that you have to go beyond the region. And actually, all of, I think all of the cloud service providers that are saying, okay, you have to go beyond one region, just in case those region is going to fail. Yeah, so now we can see uh, we are utilizing as well the secondary secondary region. So we have region re region A and region A, B that should, uh, region A that should be called A, uh, other way around, sorry. And now you see that we have started with simple instances. Now we have over four times more components. We are having a multiple um, a level of complexity more, and that's not all because this is just you know, the implementation phase still, right? So you can see that we have added a complete region with the two additional, uh, with the two availability zones. Not only that, but we are also starting to replicating the data on the cloud storage as well in both direction. And for that one, as you can see, this allows us to increase our availability, increase our resiliency. However, um, we still have to think about this complexity aspect and how this is going to be uh, addressed, how it's going to be reduced in some way, in such a way that this is still going to be manageable, right? And that's not even the case here because as you can see, 
this particular solution, it's not active active. It's like an active passive solution, right? What if this should be active active? So we would have be having multi region, multi region RDSs. We would have to have multi region some kind of the applications. Maybe different kind of uh, services would come into the hand. Like for example, having a containers working in distributing our workloads. So <coughs> the more nines we add into the equation, the more complex. Uh, not only from the, the more complex from technical. Um, process, uh, technical and process perspective it becomes, and also be aware that each additional lines will definitely increase the cost, right? So you also have to navigate this because um, each time that there is this kind of uh, massive outage that is being popular in the media, uh, a lot of, you know, specifically with the SMBs, right? So SMBs, they want to have five nines, right? But I don't want to spend anything on that. So you can't go five times in such approach because those five nines, they're going to mess up with your technology, mess up with your business and influence influence your actually budget because this is going to cost you, right? It's not, there's no free, free, free dinner, I would say for that one, right? So on that one, uh, I think I was able to only touch touch the you know like touch the surface that was the, the that was the idea of this um of the session not to you know like to solve this com completely but just to touch and um, educate on why it is important how we can try to talk with the business what kind of measurements we can take how to you know like uh, also negotiate with the stakeholders because sometimes there are this occasion when we have this stakeholder i would best of ability and best is a term that is not uh, something that we can describe into the solution, right? Because this is this is a term that is vague, right? So be ha please do have this in mind that you can utilize this knowledge. I hope that you will utilize this knowledge to work with the stakeholders on your engagements, on your projects, to try to narrow down because in the end, you are going to be responsible that the solution that you have designed matches the requirements. And they, if the requirements are phony or not, uh, or are vague, then it's hard to measure this, right? And if it is hard to measure this, you cannot make sure that they are going to be measured appropriately and you are going to achieve the expectation from the availability. And this is super critically important in regards of the business continuity, right? Because if you do not have the valid availability, then how do you measure it, right? Yeah, now going back into the you know, like wrap up, active passive solution, we have some increased resiliency within the regions, right? So we are utilizing multiple availability zones. Then we have also shown um, the multi-region, basic multi-region as a, an active passive solution. There's, there are the ways to achieve the active active across the region. However, the complexity increases tenfold at this point in time, right? Um, with the S3, with the cloud storage, we can talk about the recover recoverability aspects because then we can introduce the, the backup processes, then we can introduce the replication of that data between the buckets, and we can also conduct the re restore of the data in the separate region as well, right? And I do think that the provided example is a balance between the availability requirements and the complexity in regards how to make this one. Okay, because I'm talking and I'm running out of words, and I know that you're going to not trust me on that one. Um, I, I recently found out uh, one of the example, and this is actually the real life example, why it is important uh, from the business continuity uh, example. So in order to engage you, I have one question. Do we have anybody from uh, Google, coming from the Google expertise on, on our meeting? Everybody familiar with the Google services, uh, GCP, doing designs, doing solutions on top of the GCP. Okay, so for those, uh, if we do not have those uh, with us, um, recently uh, I would like to share a real life example of that one. So for those of you that do not know or didn't hear that, like two over two days ago, uh, one of the regions uh, in the GCP was severely affected. Uh, and you can see uh, some summary because you know like the the incident started at 25 of April, uh, 7 p.m. PDT. So uh, it took some time to identify what was the reason for that one. Uh, and as you can see, summary says that multiple Google Cloud services in Europe West nine regions are impacted. And actually, I have allowed myself to um, flash out that uh, currently at this point in time, there is no current ETA for recovery of operations in the region at this time. Yep. So this was on one day ago. Currently, we have a, we are having some kind of the improvements on that one. Uh, there is no longer service unavailability, but service degradation currently. However, at 
I have just checked before this presentation and there are still no ETAs when the service is going to be bring back online, right? And I would like to use this example um, for a several reasons. Firstly, uh, remember when we have start discussion with the SLAs in, uh, in mind, right? So even the GCP have the service uh, SLA um, for us, we are aware of that, right? There are some things beyond our and their control that can happen that will impact uh, our operations, right? It may even happen that they will not be able to recover in time, right? And okay, we are going to be uh, allowed for reimbursement from the financials. However, if, if our operations and business, those are running on top of that, the reimbursement might not be enough in some of the cases, right? Because our trust will be impacted by our customers, right? Additionally, um, I think it is very important to emphasize that this is an example of the BCP communication as well, because um, there's a complete uh, threat on that. Uh, and the Google Cloud Platform is updating this regularly, right? So we as an customers, we as a users of their services, we are well aware um, uh, what is happening when uh, there is going to be some uh, kind of the update and when potentially and the solution, uh, the services are going to be bring back back online, right? So you can see also there's this diagnosis aspect, workaround, and some kind of time time sheet as well. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure if they have kind of updated this during our session. However, I would like to to encourage all of you um, to go over the real life examples coming from cloud providers, AWS, Azure, GCP, because all of them they are having their and um, availability, uh, I would say availability sites when you can uh, when you can go and check the service and have the description like this and go over historic events, go over examples what have have led into the severe outages, right? So, I will give you another example. I think it's coming from Asia on this time. So, in one of the availability zone of Asia, they were conducting the electrical tests and the electrical during those electrical tests. Uh, the uh, auxiliary power supply have failed because the 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 fuel pump in this uh, in this power generator it failed and uh, the uh, this availability zone have literally run out of the power supply yeah and even if they you know they were prepared for that they have they were having this kind of power uh, auxiliary power support generator for that purpose there are some cases that most of us will not invent by ourselves and only by reading some i would say some horror stories we can be uh, we can educate ourselves and build our knowledge and awareness how even those small glitches small things can impact our solutions right and in most cases the and uh, the cloud providers will say um as a workaround customer can fail over to zones in other regions right so Apparently, we're ending up in the situation when all of the things that we are going to have to do, they are going to have to be multi-region. And even if that happens, we can have some kind of core service, be it Route 33, that if this is not going to be available, then our uh, our operations will be impacted, right? So there's this ultimate failure that is beyond our control or, or on the other hand, is so complex that we are going to over-engineer, right? Because how often the particular service, Route 33, actually is going to be out of service and do we need to invent a wheel for the second time? Or we are fine with, and our stakeholders are fine and communicated that uh, it is okay that if our services are going to be down for two hours, right? There's no need for implementing millions of costs to try to protect up, uh, before some of the corner cases. Okay, guys, uh, that's going to be all, like promised, uh, non super specifically technical session. It's more about, you know, like thinking policies, thinking principles, thinking guidelines, thinking processes uh, with small example, how we can apply for that. Um, thank you very much for attending the session. Thank you very much for, for having me on that one. I hope that at least for some part of you, it was uh, interesting and informative. Uh, and now I do encourage you to go over those um, those um, postmortems. Uh, actually, Google even I think calls this postmortems. So go over, have some kind of uh, read over those, and think about have those in mind next time you are going to design the solution. 